Swipe for that. And this Hangout on Air is live, which is very good. And I'm here today uh, with uh, Suzanne, all the way from which part of the world are you in there, Suzanne? I'm in the southwest portion of the United States in San Diego, near San Diego, California. Absolutely fantastic. And my name's Alexander Hayes, coming all the way from Canberra, ACT Australia. And uh, with me I have Suzanne. And Suzanne, a short time ago we met for the very first time via Google Hangouts and introduced ourselves. And for those who are going to access this in the future, do you think you could provide us with basically a, you know, like a brief introduction as to how you, who you are and how you managed to get involved in uh, uh, part of the Google Glass side of things? Well, I'm just a single woman who's here in, in San Diego and I've always been interested in technology. I happened to get involved in uh, Google Plus and when they had the opportunity to get an invitation to get Google Glass, I decided to take the plunge and entered the If I Had Glass contest. And I just said if I had glass, I would represent my demographic, women over 60, to prove that, um, to chronicle an active and joyful journey into old age, I hope, <laughs> this might share a, a perspective that life and worthiness and excitement about technology isn't over when you turn 65. Let's put a window on my world. And I wow. guess they thought that was a reasonable <laughs> reason to uh, to give me the chance to try this out. So Very cool. I was Very cool. shocked when I was chosen, but I was. So then mm. I decided I needed a mentor, so I um, contacted Cecilia Abadi because she lived in, she lives nearby, not then, she lives about an hour away from me and um, we met up back in May and she's been a big, a big reason why uh, this has become such an exciting project for me. Absolutely. So uh, that kind of is the basis for, um, you know, we, as I spoke to you in our meeting there, you know, there's only a small amount of awareness of glass across Australasia, where I'm located, um, in a general sense. And but you identified as as being part of the glass explorers community. So, you know, how important do you think it's going to be for to have a glass community that's kind of you know geographically specific for our part of the world? Well, I think it's going to be big to connect people all over the world and get you know hopefully bring a better understanding of of us to each other's cultures and maybe encourage travel. I mean, I've traveled to Australia. It's a great country and a lot to see. And um, and just in that sense, just encouraging people to travel and go to other parts of the world and not be afraid that something horrible is going to happen to them. Mm, and that might be the basis for you coming across this way as well. Um, is really is this the first time that you've been involved in in wearable technology, or when and where did you start getting involved in this technology? Actually, you're right. It is one the first time that I really thought about wearable technology. I've heard about the watches, and I've you know I've been watching, and I've been involved, I've been I've enjoyed tech for a long time. Used to work in the industry, and so I just kind of keep an eye on things. But watches, they seem never appealed to me because once I got a cell phone I stopped wearing a watch and so when glass came along then it made more sense to me because of the hand, hands-free aspect of it and the um, um, and the voice recognition that uh, gives you this those kind of abilities mm -hmm. It's not a different, a slightly different tack, you know. I said to you, uh, Suzanne, I'll, I'll meet you shortly, and I'm going to go across the web and have a good look around. And I, I came across your G Plus profile, but it's it's pretty much almost entirely empty. Of course, it connects to everything, but where else could visitors find out about your work? Where would they find out more about you? My work. I'm mostly a community volunteer at this point in my life, and I do have a, a little part-time job I can do from home, but. Um, I volunteer my passions, that's kind of why I got involved in GLASS too, to promote my passions, which are the League of Women Voters, which is a nonpartisan political organization 
that was started by our suffragists back in the 20s, you know, Susan B. Anthony and Carrie Catt. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a 100-year-old organization, and I think it's important for people to vote and be educated when they vote, so I've gotten involved with that. So I've tried to promote, I promote this, my, that organization through, with GLASS, and I volunteer at a botanic garden. I'm really interested in botanic gardens. I, when I was in Australia even, I visited um, those a lot there. And so I promote that, and then I promote the city that I live in, which is Carlsbad. It's, it's right on the ocean, and, um, and it's it's a really nice place to live. So, I, I and I know a lot of people around in the community. So that's what I do. Mm. Pretty much. Very, at this point. very extensive. Very extensive. So, um, Suzanne Glass, you know, it might have a big impact on public and private spaces in the near future. So, within what you do within your life, are you noticing any changes in the way that people treat you as a result of of wearing glass, and whereabouts don't you wear glass? Well, it's really evolved over these last six months, and I got glass on the 1st of July, and my glass is not, um, I got the, sh the shale, so it kind of blends in with my salt and pepper hair, and I can go out in public and nobody even notices, <laughs> I go to the big warehouse store or the supermarket and walk around and not. And I think they don't expect to see somebody my age wearing the latest in technology. So mm -hmm. people would never even comment on it. But once um, Cecilia uh, got her ticket, and that was all in the news in this area, it was big news around here in the beginning for a long time, people started noticing more that I was wearing glass. So then they, then they were... Uh, were interested. I mean, I have worn them in, in the bathroom, and nobody even noticed it. So, mm -hmm. um, but my friends, they kind, my friends being in the older demographic, they do keep me kind of uh, in check. In check because they are more concerned about the privacy issue, ah. and they think that, you know, one of my friends who I only told one friend I was going to apply for this, and she said to me, well go for it, and so I did, and then the minute I got them, she said, don't take that picture, <laughs> don't take a shot of me, and I'm like, okay, I don't get it, but, I mean, and these are people who travel and everything, they've been to London, and they know that video cameras are everywhere, mm. and it was funny, when people said that to me, I, one time, I walked into the post office, and I looked up, and there were at least seven video cameras right down on, looking on me, and I'm thinking, why are people worried about their privacy in public? I mean, that, that part I don't understand. Because mm. when you're in public, you're in public. Mm. But I, I try to be sensitive about it because uh, that my friends were were not were not as comfortable around it as the younger kids. That when I would when I meet younger kids, they're just really excited about it and they don't have any any qualms. And some older people. Are that way too, but then there's the, then there are the others that are just um, that it's privacy. That's their whole thing about it, and so mm. Mm. I try mm. to be sensitive to them. But I was in a meeting. We had a meeting yesterday, and I take care of the newsletter, our websites, and I need photographs for the websites. And this has become my primary camera, and so I just told them yesterday, you know, I'm I'm taking pictures now. For, we are the other person that used to take pictures doesn't do it anymore. So I said, "This is my camera, and I'm going to be taking pictures." And so nobody was. They were very calm about it yesterday. I was really excited about that. Mm. Look, I, usually you know, they're. No, no, while, while we're while we're talking about cameras there and people's perception, look, there's a lot of there's many shifts towards workplaces and uh, in you know educational institutions as having. Surveillance cameras that are installed even inside the washrooms. So how how will we need need to consider our social etiquette in the future? You know, for people that are wearing glass, you know, in the workplace or the classroom or as you've indicated there, even the bathroom. Well, I think you learn as you as you have them, have it. In the beginning, it was, and maybe it's because this is 
this is not a consumer item and not, not a lot of people out there have them, but you kind of learn how, uh, it's hard for me to, how, how people feel about it. You can sense it in a way. You can sense how they feel. And so I, I carry my case with me and I kind of judge when I think it's not appropriate and I take them off and put them in, put them in the case and carry them with me that way rather than um, force myself onto people. Like I, wouldn't, like I wouldn't wear them in the movies like that. I went to the movies last week and I didn't wear them there. Mm -hmm. I think particularly because over here we're getting different things are happening to people and it ends up in the news. So you kind of get an idea of what it is that people are sensitive about. And so then you can base your, your um, behavior on that. Mm. Look at Susan as a researcher with an interest in these emergent technologies and the diffusion of innovation and the social impact that's likely to happen with glass. Do you think glass is going to be a game changer for us all? So what do you think? I think you know, what, what do you consider so. the reactions will be I think. towards the demographics of people in your area? The, um, I think a lot. Some of the people in my age group, a lot of the people in my age group probably won't adopt it because of the energy and the effort that it takes to learn it and how comfortable you feel with it. I've always felt comfortable with technology and I, I, I like to figure things out, but a lot of people I, I know, they, they still are having trouble with computers. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be a whole group that won't, that won't adopt it because it's just, it's not going to be, something they that's not something they think they need or maybe not want to spend the money on it too that's the thing I think price is going to be be a, a factor this is, mm -hmm. a, this is not for everybody because it's expensive mm -hmm. so it's price points and yeah, uh, people's people's yeah. abilities and so on but how do you well, how do you think um, differing cultures uh, are likely to adopt or reject or perhaps even challenge this this uh, technological shift in a cultural context? Well, one thing I'm thinking of, I've, I think I, being a volunteer at the Botanic Garden, I see how things, how it can be used in the agricultural aspect, I guess you'd say. And so it's possible that agrarian cultures might find a, 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 a real use for it. I was thinking yeah. of like seed, I shouldn't give my ideas away, but um, for we have someone who collects seeds there at the garden from all the flowers and to me she's sitting there writing everything down. She could be doing it, she could be taking pictures, she could be do, dictating into glass and taking videos and it would be totally hands-free. I've been in the garden, and we've been having we and we do an herb garden, and we've had questions about what something is, like an albino pomegranate, and I can look at right look up look it up without taking my gardening gloves off or anything. I can just say, okay, glass, and ask it a question. And um, uh, my friends have they've been pretty impressed by that. I think so. Once you wear it, that's the problem too. If people are too afraid to try them on and see what it's like, they're never going to know when they're always going to be biased against it. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. really. uh, definitely. And Suzanne, looking at our first introduction, you identified to me as an adopter of technology. I think you've, you know, you've reiterated that a couple of times, an early adopter. Yeah. Can you detail for the audience who are watching this video, and many of them will, will identify with you um, in many different ways, how do you think your exploration of the use of this technology um, is is important for other people? Do you see yourself as a as a as a champion of this, or or has it just become a second nature to you? I don't think it's as much a second nature as a lot of some of the younger ones or people that are still out in the work world. I'm at home a lot and. I don't wear it all the time when I'm home, and I. Um, but I've been giving demo. I give demos at the library at our library here, and I give 
and more and more people, I mean a lot of people came to this last demo, I was really surprised. Wow. They are really interested in it and um, the kids are just are really excited about it. So whether or not, I know I just I just like getting it out in the community and as time goes by people more and more people are are know what it is and um, are interested in it and I'm always willing to to let them try them on so it's on that exciting. note on, it is exciting and that on that note there's probably a number of people in the, the audience that are watching this that would be very interested in in you coming and being part of doing being being here with us talking about that to librarians and to groups there's botanical gardens just up the road from me here and so this is the the biggest question of all and hopefully people will follow through on that invitation to you by watching this video what do you consider Suzanne to be the most immediate and then say short term and longer term impact this is going to have on humanity this particular type of technology I think, like you this specifically, I think it will be in healthcare and um, early, the first responders, like, and also the um, and education. I think there, you know, there are here they're already starting really to adopt it to edu for education. And I hope the aging. There's a lot more working. I mean, because I always I was always afraid of getting old because I I would definitely get bored if I could didn't have anything to do, but now that the com that I've gotten so involved in computers and that kind of thing, I'm not afraid at all because I think as long as I have my sight and my hearing, it's it's going to be I can you know, I'll always have a window, a window to the world, and that's that's going to be great. Mm. Suzanne, it's an absolute pleasure talking with you, and and you're a living example of of. Uh, <laughs> An early adopter, and I, and it's inspire. It will be very inspiring for those people watching this, uh, and I will be distributing this across my networks, which is pr principally in the higher education, uh, network technology, and uh, many other environments as well. So thank you very much for for joining me on this um, this class interview, which will accompany the others, and um, uh, upon the conclusion, this this recording will be distributed everywhere. So I'm very appreciative of your time. Thank you. Well, thank. Thank you for your interest, and I'm really honored to be part of this project. Thank you.